yesterday for a friend of ours, and one of the persons got up there and said, you know, there's a statement that I learned a long time ago, and it says, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> this is a song I wrote a long time ago, and you've heard it, people. But there's nothing wrong with doing it again. <laughs> He's my rock and redeemer. I know that every day as the day moves along, I can tell always. My Lord will always let me know when I've done something wrong. He's my rock and redeemer. He'll help me get along. As our days grow shorter and our nights longer, we who are people of faith turn to symbols, such as candles, evergreens, and wreaths, to proclaim our belief in the unquenchable light, in hopeful anticipation. We prepare for the coming of the reign of God. Listen for the word in the words of the prophet for the first Sunday of this new church year. We open our hearts to the word in the words. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. So when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down the mountains, quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard. No ear has perceived, no eyes has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who, who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, our inquiries like the wind take us away. 
There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of your in iniquity. Yes, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. As we begin our journey to the light, we can invest in that our lives are not always limited in ways pleasing to God. Our lives are not always pleasing to God. Our shame has left us feeling distant from the one who is loved of the mother and father to us all. The one in whose hands we are by the way. Yet even now, we are longing for the one who cares for the one in the heavens and comes down. We who are, are, are pregnant with anticipation feel hope rise up within us. And so we light this first candle and we name it Hope. <laughs> Here's a game that might seem familiar to you. I play it myself every now and then. I call it If Only. You ever play If Only, the If Only game? It's when uh, we get to a point in our lives where we say, if only I had X, then everything will be all right. Uh, you've played it in times when you, you're feeling uh, uh, doubtful. You're, you're, you're playing it during times when you, when you might be just feeling cruddy and you might feel like the world is working against you. And you say, if only. If only I had a boyfriend. If only I had bought a winning lottery ticket. If only I had parents who understand me. If only I had children who respected me. <laughs> and it goes on and on. And we play this and, um, you know. But then, every now and then, we play the other game. Now this game is very similar to If Only. This game is called, When X Happens, Then Things Will Be Great. Have you ever played that game? I've played that game too. Um, we tend to do these things like, uh, when I finally get that job that I've been looking for, things will be great. All my troubles will go away. Sometimes we might say something like, oh, when I finally get married, Life will be so wonderful and so grand. And that may be true, but it may not be up to the expectations that you thought it was going to be. We might say things, if only I get this, uh, or uh, when I get this shiny new pickup truck, life is going to be like a choose your own adventure storybook. I'm going to have so much fun on that. I'm going to go four-wheeling. I'm going to do all these wonderful, great things. But then what happens? 
reality sets in. And all of a sudden we realize that some of these things, uh, like that job that you were uh, anticipating, the job that's going to solve all your problems, that job might come along with a whole new set of problems that you weren't anticipating. And sometimes that new job may even have more problems than the one that you left. The whole thing about, uh, you know, when I get married and when I have kids, boy, everything's going to be great. You know what? It is. It's a wonderful thing. But it has a lot of challenges that comes along with it too, doesn't it? And that new pickup truck, when we are paying the wrecker as he's uh, pulling that thing out of a mud pit because we neglected on that wonderful advertisement on television that we thought it was going to be a choose-your-own-adventure, you ever notice on the very bottom of the screen it says, do not attempt this with your own vehicle. This is a controlled track or a controlled, uh, a, a controlled thing for, right, for advertisement's purposes. Uh, so, you know. Hope is good, isn't it? Hope is a great thing. And that's the thing about the, uh, the, the, those games. There, there's an element of hope involved. Uh, but hope is good. It's an essential component of faith. The writer of Hebrews assures us that faith is the substance, the very substance of things hoped for. But as great as hope is, it sure stings when your expectations aren't met and your hopes are let down. That's what's going on in our scripture in Isaiah today. The Israelites who were being held captive in Babylon spent much of their almost 60 years in captivity playing the if-only game. Oh, if only we had been more faithful. If only we had been more prepared. If only we could get someone to listen to us. If only someone would come and rescue us. And then when King Cyrus of Persia came in and defeated the Babylonians and it became clear that the Israelites would be able to return to their homeland, they started playing the things will get better when game. Oh, when we return to our homeland, things will be better because we'll have our holy city back. And when we get our holy city back, we'll be able to rebuild our temple. And when we rebuild our temple, God will be happy with us. And when God is happy with us, things are just great. Things will be better than ever because we will be able to sleep in our own beds. And everybody will be so happy and grateful that there will be this awesome spiritual revival that will restore us to the glory of David and Solomon. And boy, howdy, when that happens, our enemies will leave us alone. Well, you heard the passage that Bobby read this morning. It was written after the captives returned from the exile. At least the ones who even bothered to come back. And after hearing this passage, how do you suppose everything worked out for them? Not so good. It doesn't sound like it worked out very well at all. In fact, this passage is what we call a lamentation. And this is what a lamentation is. A lamentation is an expression of grief and bitterness. Why were they lamenting? Why were they grieving? Well, because they weren't happy. All of their hopes were depending on their return from exile. They thought that coming home to Jerusalem was going to mean an end of all of their problems. All of Israel's shame and restlessness and displeasure. But what happened, though, is their problems multiplied instead of vanished. Ugliness and evil continued to exist. The return to Israel was supposed to be the end of the if-only game. But here they are. They're playing it again. And in many ways, Israel's situation resembles ours. Because our hopes, our hopes, are pinned on the fact that Christ has come and lives among us. The promise has been filled. But life 
still remains imperfect. The problems of the world persist. Racial injustice, fueled by racial prejudice, continues. We continue to get drawn into wars that never seem to end. We face threats from within and without. And it never seems to get any better over time. The church is not all that it should be either. We have failed to proclaim good news when we have the opportunity. We get trapped in the institutional snares of our own design. We have failed to achieve that unity that Christ uh, called his followers to work towards. We are not all that we should be. And so we begin Advent with a round of if only. If only church was as much of a priority in people's lives as it was when I was a kid. If only they hadn't taken prayer out of schools. If only they didn't start having soccer games on Sundays. If only, if only. They didn't start selling Christmas stuff in the stores before Halloween. <laughs> if only stores would let people say Merry Christmas or let schools call winter break Christmas vacation. That would make things good. The people of Israel wanted to restore the golden age of David and Solomon's kingdom. They wanted to be a world power again. They wanted to put an end to the doormat, being the doormat of whatever empire happened to be in control at the time. And that's uh, what they wanted, though. But the circumstances, they just weren't right. There was no way, short of a major intervention by an all-powerful God King who would tear open the heavens and come in with earthquakes and fire and armies of angels armed with plagues that would strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. That was their hope, at least. But what they got, however, was something entirely different. And what's worse, they had to wait for it. Anybody here like to wait? You know, some people do. Some people do. Waiting is what Advent is all about. Verse 4 of our text even says, From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait on him. Some people, I guess, do like to wait, especially if they know what's coming. They, they feel the sense of anticipation and they think it's exhilarating. They think it's wonderful. And you know what? That's fine and dandy for you. But when you don't know what's waiting for you, even the most patient soul can get a little antsy. Things will get better when? It's funny how we get worked up about the things uh, when we have to wait. It's funny how we get consumed by the flurry of emotions that come along with our anticipation. In this lament that Bobby read, uh, the people wanted God to hear their prayer and respond in a way that split the heavens open. Even Jesus' closest disciples expressed their desire to see fire come down from heaven just to give Jesus a little bit of extra authority in his teaching. The kingdom of God is near? Great! We'll help you bring it in. We will take up swords and help you clean up dodge, Jesus. But Jesus said, yeah, but it's not like that. In fact, the kingdom of God is small. It's subtle. In fact, it's like a little teeny mustard seed. It's like a little pinch of yeast. It's subtle. 
It grows out of something small. See, God does break into our reality on a regular basis. Sometimes it happens in big ways, like uh, what a couple of weeks ago we, we celebrated the, uh, what is it, 30th anniversary of the Berlin Wall coming down? Or was it the 25th? I can't remember. It was 30? 30 years. Sometimes God works in big ways like that. But other times, it is more subtle. Like when a broken relationship is healed because of forgiveness. That's a lot more subtle. A lot of folks in Isaiah's time, all the way up until the time of Jesus, were looking for a powerful leader to annihilate Rome. They lamented. They pleaded, they bargained, they prayed. They thought they knew what they wanted. But what they really needed was an adjustment in perspective. They needed something different, something that was appropriate for the time that they were living. And what they got was something small, something like a mustard seed. Something like a pinch of yeast. What they got was a baby. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. And so God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. At Advent, we reenact Israel's watching and waiting. We relive their prayers and their longings, alert to God whispers, or God winks, as you say, Kathy, as well as the God shouts. Restore us, O Lord Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved.